Good. So you may know that over the last four times I've been here, we had a guest teacher, uh, Stephen Snyder, during one of those weeks. Um, during the last four times we've been here, I've given talks, pretty structured presentations, about the Buddha's four noble truths, probably better translated all in a sense as four ennobling truths. And I looked at them through the lens of anxiety because certainly for many reasons, uh, all times are anxiety provoking, but I think our current moment is pretty anxiety provoking as well. So how can we deal with you know, the sense of threat, the sense of challenges to safety, deal with feelings of anger and helplessness and fear. How can we do all, how can we practice with all that? How can we get help for all that inside ourselves through the lens of these four major statements of the Buddha that there is in fact suffering. Uh, suffering has a cause. A primary cause of suffering is our own craving, our own reactivity, the reactions we add to the inevitable uh, pains and sorrows of this life. Uh, happily, in the third noble truth, there is in fact an end to that craving and the suffering it causes. There can be a complete radical cessation of craving, uh, typically achieved through meditative practice and transformative experiences. There can also be a gradual reduction of craving along the way. In my language, we can gradually spend less and less time in the red zone and more and more time in the green. Then there's the fourth noble truth, which is a path, a, a trustable, credible, believable path that involves less and less suffering, less and less craving, less and less sense of self, less and less harm to ourselves and others along the way and leads ultimately to the complete, utter, irrevocable liberation of the heart. So that's what I presented. If you'd like um, to uh, take a look at the notes uh, that I wrote up for my talks, uh, you can find those uh, if you go to the Wednesday Meditation webpage. And uh, I won't do that right now, but if some helpful person can put a link to uh, the archive of my talks and um, make related meditations, that would be great. If you want, you can go back and take a look at that. Having covered a lot of ground in four talks, um, I wanted to reserve this time for questions and answers, for you know your own particular questions. I'll take them a lot from um, the chat, uh, but hopefully there'll be time to talk with one or two or three people uh, live if you're up for that. And if you'd like to do that, I'll, I'll tend to, if I can, pick people, uh, if there are many people who'd like to do it, who haven't spoken before. Uh, so you know, my portion of this is recorded. Uh, if I do talk with an individual, we include the recording of your voice, but we don't show your face and we don't give your identity. All right. So let's just see here. Questions, comments so far? Anything about anxiety? Anything good? Seeing, I'm checking out questions. I see Rachel has her hand up. Great, okay. So let's see, right off the top. Rachel, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and if you're willing to turn on your camera. Hey yeah, there. you know, let's see. <laughs> Here we go. I got it. Okay, yeah, you good. know, I I suffer from chronic anxiety and PTSD, okay. ah. and um, you know, I'm just trying to retrain my body to calm down, and I'm really thankful to come to these to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any other comments about that type of condition and just kind of that chronic low grade simmering yeah. anxiety. Yeah. Oh. Well, first, truthfully, I feel for you, you know, right? And one of the, I think, proper initial reactions that's helpful is to have this kind of combination of compassion and recognition of injustice. Like, it just is not fair that things happen to you, things happen to us. Here you are probably years later, and it's still landing on you. 
And I, yeah, I just I, think- yeah, I worked, yeah, I worked as an RN for 20 years. Yeah. And then I just couldn't leave my house for 20 years. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's not right. So, that, so we start with compassion. And I think part of compassion sometimes includes a sense of injustice, which really means, which is a way of honoring yourself. And I'm, I'm saying this to you, Rachel, and I'm also speaking really to all of us. Uh, and to observe in your mind, if you can, any reluctance to bring compassion to yourself or any reluctance to recognize that injustices happened to you, happened in the past, maybe still in the present, if they did, and also almost biologically, right? We're sort of designed to remember bad experiences. You know, that's the whole thing I talk about, the negativity bias, the brain like Velcro for the bad, but Teflon for the good, right? And, and yet here we are, we're kind of haunted we're, we're, you know, the, the, the stone got thrown into the pond 20 years ago, but the ripples are still somehow in our life today. And there's a place where we start. We just feel that. We recognize that. Ugh. Okay, we don't, we don't end there. We don't stop there. But that's a good beginning. And it's really foundational for a lot of people. And if they had more compassion for themselves and a more of a sense of being on their side and witnessing the injustices that happened, the different cruddy things that occurred, it, it would be helpful to them. That's for sure. That's for sure. I'll say a second thing, Rachel, and then I'll, I'll keep moving to some other people. A second thing, and this could be really interesting, is to uh, allow the fear, the anxiety, if it's persistent, to be like background noise, like a pain in your back uh, that is there. It's unpleasant, okay, but it doesn't mean anything. And not add any secondary reactivity to the anxiety and to treat it increasingly as an impersonal condition. Like me, you are a big monkey. And when bad things happen to monkeys, naturally, they're off, or mammals, really. You see, had things happen to a dog or a cat, you know. Um, I had a cat at one point who was traumatized by being attacked by three dogs. I rescued her, you know, probably seconds before she would have been killed by them. And she was traumatized after that forever, and it wasn't her fault, right? So um, it can be helpful to realize it's kind of impersonal. It's, it's just mammalian, and not to, and then not take take it seriously, not make it mean that something's wrong. For example, that you can't leave your house. It's just there. It's like a low grade toothache in the background that just doesn't go away. It's unfortunate, you know. It's a first start, but it doesn't have to mean anything. That's a very useful thing. Um, and then I'll just leave you with a last suggestion on you know the structure that I've given so far, uh, and I do this myself. It's really important to, and you sometimes have to fight for this, it's really important to be able to sustain attention to what's going okay. Amidst the pain, your tooth hurts, there's background anxiety, and still there's enough air to breathe, right? Still the water is available. In for the record, a plastic bottle that I keep reusing and reusing and reusing as the weeks go by. So um, that's so important. And it goes to something extremely primal, uh, rooted in our own biology. We need reassurance. We're so vulnerable. We're so exposed. There's a beautiful Zen saying. The Zen master was asked, I think it's... Um, Unman, I'm going to get the name wrong. Some others will know it. He was asked, what does it mean that a tree withers and its leaves fall? And he said, body exposed in the golden wind. We are all exposed in the golden wind of change, of seasons, of, of shivering, of winter. We're all exposed. And yet the wind is beautiful to be exposed in the golden wind means also being vulnerable to withering and leaves falling. 
right? It's part of the great matter. And so in that context then, it's very important to honor the, the importance of reassurance and soothing and comfort, including in very tactile, simple, sweet, mm-hmm kinds of ways, yeah. And then when we can turn to that, there is still breathing. There still is water. There still are good people. There still is the flower. There still is the moment. There still is the chocolate chip cookie. Um, There still is this alongside what's bad, for real, but alongside it. And to turn to that and fight, to rest attention there sometimes and to stay with the feeling of it. It's extremely important. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Is that okay, Rachel? Thank you very much, yes. I'm gonna look for that alternate universe that you're talking about of the calm wind. The golden, <laughs> the golden wind. You can find that koan, but there's no alternate universe. This water, your breath, the good people right now. The, the, the chronic anxiety universe versus this other side. That's what I'm referring to. Yeah, you keep looking for it. So the anxiety is there. It's okay. And still, and also. That would be my encouragement to you. And also what is true. And also. Okay, very good. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm going to mute you here. Okay, great. So Carrie, uh, and then Kay and Carol. So Carrie L., I'm going to ask you to unmute. Great. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm wondering, I feel like I flip flop between anxiety and depression and yeah. I can't, I don't always know what to <laughs> focus on. Like I'll listen to talks about anxiety and mm-hmm. then go, well, maybe I should really be focusing on depression mm-hmm. or, or are they just flip sides of the same thing? Is that, any thoughts from you? Oh, with yeah, them? for sure. And I think, uh, you're, you're astute. There's an acronym in therapy world, SAD, sad, anxious, depressed. Mm. You know, and they kind of go together. Depression is more of a mood. Anxiety can become a mood, right? Like Rachel was talking about. And uh, so it's more in the background. It becomes kind of chronic. We, people can develop trait anxiety. But, you know, anxiety often is also a state. Depression is more of a mood. Sadness is more of a feeling, but they do tend to come together. It's kind of like a unholy trifecta, unfortunately, you know. So what we can look for, of course, um, are the sources of them. And that's where you might ask yourself, and maybe I'll ask you right now, right? Um, You know, is there a source or two, including inside your own mind, that you could work on or practice with that would be helpful to you? A source that I could work yeah. with? I'm, I'm jumping kind of quickly. I'm kind of going for it here. So let me back up and just kind of explain. Uh, this is not at all blaming the victim. It's just to take a look at, yes, if the world outside were improved or our physical health were improved, that would probably help a lot. So I think it's always good to think about what could I do in the world outside? What could I do with my physical body? But then, meanwhile, what can I do with my mind? So here would be a question for you. Are there are you aware of any mental processes that, you know, make you feel anxious or sad or depressed? And if so, then what would help inside your mind? That's what I'm going to move to. What would help especially? Well, to me, it's an unsolvable problem. I like when I was a kid, um, my parents got divorced young. It was a bitter divorce, alcoholic mother, Jekyll and Hyde type personality when she was drinking um, and couldn't have friends over, couldn't have kids, very isolated because you, you, and it's just like, I'm in my fifties. I still struggle with just like friends and people and relationships, being lonely, that kind of thing. And yet- I don't know. You can't just manufacture best friends. I've moved all over the country my whole life. So, you know, you build up friends for five years, then you get transferred somewhere else. So that kind of thing. Well, I have a suggestion just from what you said there, Carrie, which I really appreciate. And it goes to a fundamental nature we have as, like I said, big monkeys. You know, we're social. 
or social. And um, I'll say for people in general, it's a really helpful to ask yourself these four questions. And these are clinical questions. I think of them when I'm working with people or I'm, a, or I'm in a teaching role, but we can think of them for ourselves too. What's the challenge? And especially what's the experience of the challenge? So you're describing, for example, the challenge being in childhood, disrupted relationships, not a lot of steady support for you that you could take into yourself, moving a lot. You know, these are challenges. And then you're left inside with a sense of loneliness and all that comes with that, including feeling sad, anxious, and depressed, okay? First question. Second question. This is the money question. What if it were more present inside your mind, more present inside your being? would really help. This is in addition, of course, to what outside you might help and what in your physical body, your physical health might help, but in your mind, in your psychology. What if it were more present would really help? And then once we identify that, we go to the third question, how can you experience it? And fourth, how can you internalize those experiences and gradually hardwire them literally into your nervous system, into your body? So what I'm hearing first is that there's loneliness, there's sadness, there's anxiety, there's depression, there's feeling exposed <laughs> to the winds, not always so golden in this life, right? So it would help if you felt more cared for, if you'd felt genuinely more cared for and included and seen and, and appreciated and liked and loved. That would really help. Okay, good. Now we've kind of zeroed in on the medicine. So then the question is, how can you experience that? authentically, not fake, but real, and then internalize, take in the good of those experiences, right? So with regard to feeling more cared about, um, I entered adulthood with what felt like a really big hole in my heart of unmet needs. You know, I didn't get enough, I didn't experience enough love. I didn't experience enough inclusion and prizing and being valued by other people. So then I worked a lot on looking for opportunities that were real to experience that, starting you know, when I went off to college and then onward, uh, to really, really take it in. So uh, all around us, all around us, unless we're living like the Unabomber did, you know, completely isolated, well, <laughs> fiendishly trying to blow people up, we all are surrounded by opportunities for at least five, one or more of these five ways to feel cared about from simple to more developed. First of all, to feel they were part of something, they were included in some way. Here, you're part of this group. It's not more than what it is, but it's not less than what it is. There are probably other ways to feel like a sense of camaraderie. You know, you, you are among many, many people who had a bad hand dealt to them in childhood, right? And there's some people who had it worse, I had it better. And it was still kind of sucked, you know, for me, right? So that's a sense of belonging. So important to feel like we belong, okay, first. Second, we all have opportunities. Usually we have opportunities to feel seen. Like clearly here I am seeing, I am listening to you. There is empathy. It's not perfect, but I'm trying, right? There are people who do listen, who do receive. And that's real. And when it's real, when the facts of it are real, when the fact is real that you're included, when the fact is real that you're seen, help yourself have an experience of that. That's your special medicine. That's manna from heaven. That's gold. That's nectar. That's water for a thirsty woman. Take it in. You know, that's yours to value. Not brush aside, not minimize it, not push it at arm's length to, because you're afraid of longing for more, which is understandable. But helping yourself not do that helping yourself realize that in the privacy of your own being, you really can take it in, okay? Third, to feel appreciated in some way, respected, valued. You know, people, uh, you know, there's a sense of maybe gratitude for you in some way, you know, looking for that. We're going up the ladder here, but often we can find a sense uh, there's appreciation. You know, there's some kind of valuing of you. Uh, I value you right now for sticking your neck out here takes gumption and guts to do that. It's real. Again, it's not more than what it is. We're not trying to fake it till we make it, but it's real. It's not less than what it is. And then 
forth feeling liked, and then, of course, feeling loved. It's also really important to realize that when you feel your own caring in those five ways, that you are care- you're transmitting caring, not, not just receiving it. There's something really powerful about that that draws us, will draw you into feeling safer somehow and less anxious and less lonely when you're caring yourself, when you move through your day with a certain friendliness and compassion toward others, when you deliberately find compassion for strangers you pass on the street or deliberately get in touch with a basic friendliness or seeing the good in other people who are not perfect, they're not saints, and still, you can see the good in them. When you do that yourself, which is always under your power to do, it will help you feel less lonely and it will naturally help you feel less anxious. And over time, as you take it in, it will bring happiness to you and you'll feel less sad and less depressed. So right there is a huge practice. And it's one that I myself have really, really walked. I really know about that road. And I It's a real road, Carrie. You can walk it. And every day, when you know you're going to walk that road, then you look out each day and you think, you know, darn that Rick, but (laughs) I'm going to look for the facts of forms of caring of different kinds that are real. And then I'm going to help myself feel it when I see it. And then I'm really going to help myself slow down for a breath or longer to feel it in my body and appreciate what feels good about it, which will through positive neuroplasticity, hardwire that into myself. I'm going to do that. When you orient to your day like that, suddenly you have purpose. You feel better. It taps into a natural moxie that I can kind of see in you, a natural spunk. You know, yeah, saw that smile. Uh, So um, that's good. And then when you go to bed that night, maybe look back and before you fall asleep, take a moment to just sort of rewind some of those good experiences, at least one. And let it sink in, spread inside you, come into your heart and spread inside you. Really, it's powerful medicine. I'm going to do all of it. I'll re-listen to what you said, and thanks so much. Definitely. And it will help us feel less anxious. Social support is a primal aid to anxiety. And it's okay to do these things. It's not contra-Buddhism. You know, the Buddha never said, you know, life sucks, then you die. Rinse and repeat. No! It was just nothing like that. It's really okay to engage practices. You know, we don't cling to these experiences. We internalize them so we don't have to cling to them. So then, so that we have them with us wherever we go. Okay. All right. So I, uh, Kay, I think you were next. I'm going to ask, so I'm going to mute you, Carrie. Sorry. I'm going to ask you to unmute Kay and then move on to Carol and Amrit. Great. So Kay. Uh, Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a lifelong friend who has a now grown daughter who would probably be described as having mild cognitive impairment. Mm. She's had IEPs during her schooling. She's gotten drawn into a very um, complicated life with men sexual exploitation, et cetera, Mm. et cetera. And she lives about a thousand miles away from me. So we don't see each other often, but we talk a lot. And um, this has been going on for probably about 10 years. This is your friend, right? Yes. Who has a daughter, right? A daughter, yes. What's the issue? The issue is she's developed this huge anxiety disorder. Is this an issue for you or you, or are you looking for something you might offer to your friend? Something I might offer to my friend. That's fine. Okay, good. Reason, so your friend is well, really worried about her daughter. Of course. And I understand yeah. that, but yeah. I only, um, the reason I was hoping you might have some thoughts on this subject is she, when we speak, you know, she talks as if, I'm making progress. She says she has a counselor and then she'll go on for about a half an hour and tells the same story today that she told me 10 years ago. And I've 
you know, try to do my best to, you know, offer support and it just isn't making any difference. We get back to the buts and the what ifs and I get, keep hearing the story over and over and over to the point where, for example, she won't fly even though she loves to travel because she has panic attacks when she gets on a plane. Right. Okay. So Kay, if it's okay, do you mind if I, I sort of step in here? Okay, great. So we have, we have really two issues here that are really very general. One, what do we do? Let's say in this case, UK with someone you care about who (laughs) you could just see how they're, I'm, you know, to some extent, you know, they're shooting themselves on their own foot. Or to some extent, you we can see things that would really help them to do, but they're just, they don't budge. We just see that. What do we do about that? How do we, how do we manage that? And it's a really classic issue. I mean, as a parent, you have that sometimes with your adult kids, or you have it uh, with people in the world politically scaled up that you just are stunned that it, they don't see what's right in front of their noses. As I believe George Orwell said, to see what is in front of our nose takes a constant struggle. <laughs> you know, it's a constant effort to just recognize things. So what do we do? Right. And uh, there's a lot of counsel about that that I think is really quite helpful. And for me, um, it's been helpful to appreciate the deep truth, the deep wisdom, to use a metaphor that on the one hand, we are each waves in the ocean and we are all interconnected as expressions of the same sea whose deep nature in all cases is water. Our deep nature is the same, you know, your friend and you are deeply connected. On the one hand, you and I, we're, we're, part of the same ocean of reality and humanity and so forth. While at the same time, your wave is not my wave. Your friend's wave is not your wave. And there's a kind of, there's like radical inner being, as Thich Nhat Hanh would put it, and there's radical differentiation as well. Your karmas are not her karmas. The causes and conditions that are operating in your life are different from the ones in her life, and the results are going to be different too. And there's a kind of perspective about that and a peacefulness that comes with that. There also comes a peacefulness of just looking inside and going, you know, I really have done all that I can. And it's like casting seeds on stony ground. They just, it's not working, right, to do that. So there's a certain peacefulness about that that we come to, um, where we sort of bless people and we disengage from trying to get them to budge. After a while, we just start changing the subject. Uh, We you know, maybe structure the interaction a little bit so we get as much airtime as they're getting. Uh, Maybe we say, you know, it just seems like the situation with your daughter is intractable. I really feel for you. And I I wonder if we could talk about other things too, right? Okay. Your friend, uh, this goes back to, and I'll be kind of quick here, what I said a moment ago, uh, which is, you might ask your friend, I find these questions can sometimes help, which is, you know, what would help inside your mind? Like, what what would help here? Or what would you like from me about this, right? Do you want to have a conversation that's just about empathy or do you want to have a conversation that's about problem solving? Both are really good, but it just helps me to know which kind of conversation we're going to have. Or sometimes you just say really compassionately, wow, I to- of course you feel horrible about it. And it do, do you really feel like there's anything you can actually do? And how can you come to peace, you, your friend, with an intractable condition, including a child you just cannot save, cannot rescue, you know? And, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I just think sometimes in this life, there's, there's so much we can't fix. I mean, the truth is most of the world's sorrows we can't fix ourselves, right? Um, So meanwhile, you know, we do what we can, where we can. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wish you well with this, Kay. Your friend is lucky to have you as a friend. Okay. A good person too, so. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, Carol Birch asked to unmute. Great, and then I'm gonna pop out. I know you're you're there, Amrit, and I'm gonna check out, Amrit, I'm gonna check out uh, other things in the comments too, but first, Carol. Well, it seems like we're on anxiety a lot tonight, and. Well, that's my, my topic. <laughs> My Four question, Noble Truths. My question is, um, I deal with a lot of anxiety and depression and have for years and years and years, but my question for you is panic attacks. Uh -huh, because, okay. I mean, I, I can think my way through and manage a lot of the other things, hmm. but once the panic hits, you know, yeah. those physical symptoms just... Yeah take over with the rapid heartbeat and the shakiness. And, you know, I've just had very little help from therapists. And uh, in fact, this last one said, you know, it's just like getting a shot of adrenaline. There's really not much you can do about it. And, but I have to go into situations yeah. where yeah. I, they've happened before. So that anticipation you know, they've happened, and then you begin to have fear of the fear. Right. Exactly. They've happened, and you, and if I didn't have to interact with people yeah. and could just stay with my breathing, yeah. Or you know, but then when I have to begin to interact, then I lose it. You know, and it, yeah. Well, let me jump in. I got it. Um, so it's a clinical condition, obviously, panic, and as well as a human one. So you know, I just want to be careful. I'm not giving you, you know official advice. Uh, that said, um, you're exactly right that the panic itself is a very, very, I've had one panic attack in my life and I remember it vividly. It's horrible. Uh, hopefully, you know, I'll never have another one, but I really know it. And when people, so when people say, oh, I'm panicking, I'm like, well, is it a real panic attack? And a real panic attack is like, <sighs> okay, you know what I'm talking about. So it's, yeah, it's super, very much real. A um, couple things. As you say, the issue itself is not so much the panic attack. It's the things we do to avoid having one or the fears we have about having one. That becomes really the main primary issue. So one of the things that helps, like again, so many things in the you know Buddhist psychology is to develop tolerance for the unpleasant. And things that help there are to remember that all panic attacks end usually within 20 minutes, and no one has ever died from a panic attack. And to just sort of remind yourself of that, that that's very helpful. Second, while I'm not a specialist uh, in the therapy of panic attacks and panic disorder, I'm aware, I think, of a lot of good treatments from people who specialize in this. And that would be a thing, to see someone who's truly a specialist for this uh, and um, to really work through some of those more specialized treatments. And that would be a, a question for you. Do you feel like you've really worked with specialists about this? No, I don't. Okay. Well, that's a great opportunity. And this goes to a broad point. When you're dealing with anxiety and things that scare you and that are threats, they're real threats, they're real challenges. Otherwise, we wouldn't feel anxious about them. Is to look for stones unturned. What have you not tried? How would you find someone like that? Um, I would, uh, you know, Google, Dr. Google <laughs> immediately and really go after people who identify themselves as specialists in that area. Sometimes they'll have a university appointment because they're also doing research on it. Um, it might, you know, you could ask for referrals, call your county uh, association. Uh, I think you might find people who specialize in this both at the master's level and the PhD level, probably equally. But I, I would just really look for that kind of thing. And there are, you know, genuine protocols for really, really helping a person just no longer have panic attacks. Uh, you might want to look for books about that too. But the point is to, and I'm going to generalize here and then keep going, look for stones unturned. That's always good. What haven't you tried? Because that's where there's opportunity. It may not work. It may not work. But what haven't you tried? That's a good general principle. The other is to have a kind of a thought that, you know, 
a lot of us have banged away on a problem at like a level one kind of intervention. We've tried this, we've tried that, we've put, you know, we've done this, done that. And often level one works. It's enough. But sometimes it doesn't. And then we think, and this is a very important recognition, level one interventions have not gotten the job done. I need to go to level two, whatever that might be. And there's a that's a moment when we're helping other people. We need to face the fact that sometimes as a clinician or a helper, we haven't helped them and we need to go to level two and to be honest about that with the person. So that, and then in terms of level two, often looking for uh, specialized help and then supporting yourself that you are entitled and deserving and worth. And it's appropriate to spend some money if you have to, to really address a key issue, if you can, right? So that's general. All right, Carol, I wish you well with this. Really? Yeah, don't give up. Uh, I used EMDR. EMDR really helped me with my panic attack. Um, have you ever tried that? Tried, I, but I, I think they, their their take on it was it triggers you to, you know, that it triggers the old memories. And so it was like we were, don't feel very, didn't feel very comfortable about working with that because I was just triggering too easy right into panic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, good. That's where yeah, and specialist really helps. I'll just, I'll leave it there. But good luck to you, really. Good luck to you, really. Thank you. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going to take a very quick look, Amrit, to the, oh, great. There are things that are helpful coming into the chat that other people have found helpful. Um, like a lot of things you have to see for yourself if it would be useful for you. But um, I'm seeing good comments coming in. And as Deborah wrote at 719, just like I was saying, we often avoid certain things to not risk the dreaded experience. And the dreaded experience is yucky but on the zero to 10 cost to us scale, probably, it's like a four or a five. But the cost to us of all the avoidances and swerving and shrinking and contraction and living inside an invisible cage, whoof, to avoid the dreaded experience is much worse than the cost of the dreaded experience itself. And recognizing that, and being real with yourself about it and honest, and then looking for help to be able to tolerate risking the dreaded experience, starting at a small scale and then moving upward can be a very, very important general principle. Okay, I'm seeing lots and lots of good comments from other things, great. So Amrit, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and you're gonna unmute yourself, great. Uh, hi, Rick, um, really nice to see you again. I uh, remember hearing you before. Um, I, I, my question's not to do with anxiety. So if you want me to park it, that's fine as well. I'll just ask it first. Um, I'm kind of curious. I, I guess I am curious about uh, both this, uh, the four noble truths and Buddhist ideas within the workplace and, and the, you know, the, how they are used and, and how they support people just mm. to be healthier, to flourish, to, to, to do all, you know, these good things. I guess one of the thing, one of the places where I'm kind of stuck with and trying to understand better is fundamentally in the Four Noble Truths, the fundamental idea seems to be linked to the notion of delusion of self and the way that we think about self. Um, so I guess I'm curious about your perspective on the sense of the idea of self within the, you know, Four Noble Truths right. uh, and uh, the idea of our fixed self as we in contemporary in the contemporary world, it's so important to us. So I guess I'm trying to make okay. sense of how to think about that. Yeah. Uh, like, I think it's fundamental to this notion of uh, the root of suffering, but I don't know how to logically like everything else to me flows from that in some ways so but I, right. so I don't know how to logically <laughs> reconfigure that in my head and I'm happy to park this as well if this is not the right place oh, no, for this great. question because so much of our anxiety broadly has to do with um, actual or anticipated um, attacks to the self in, including in ways where we f might feel judged by others or uh, we're vulnerable to feeling 
criticized by others or that we're less than others or others will have disdain for us or they'll exile us. Very they have to protect ourselves. And like- yeah, very understandable. So uh, for general purposes, I invite those of you who are listening here uh, to think about the distinction between person and self. And what I mean by that is that it's very clear there is a person named Amrit. There's a person named Rick. There is a particular body-mind process that is an individual wave uh, for a lifetime in the ocean of everything. It's, that's really, really clear. Along with that, humans distinct from, as best we can gather, certainly other primates. We don't really know what's going on in the minds of the cetaceans, the dolphins, the whales, the porpoises, and so forth. But certainly among primates, they don't seem to have the neurological capability uh, for a very developed sense of an I or a me or a mine. And definitely they don't have the neurological capabilities to reflect upon that character in the past when they review situations and conversations and interactions. And also the gorillas, the bonobos, the chimpanzees, orangutans, our relatives among the great apes can't project into the future. They can't imagine that if they say X to some person that they will approve of them (laughs) rather than disapprove of them, right? They don't get caught up in that. So we seem to have evolved clearly, Um, uh, you know, a sense of, a being inside us, an entity inside us, who is vulnerable to disapproval and rejection um, and longs for connection and and closeness uh, and cherishing from from other beings. Okay, so what do we do about all that? And the, I think there are two great practices to really summarize that can help us feel less anxious over time. First is to genuinely support yourself as a person and to observe any reluctances or resistances to doing reasonable things, to protect yourself in this world, to stand up for yourself, to see the good in yourself, to acknowledge and honor your own good intentions, and to deliberately, as I was saying earlier, internalize healthy social supplies. Deliberately take in the good of the recognition and the inclusion and the empathy and the affection and even the love of other people, whether it's in a workplace setting or with friends or with family. That's very important. And actually, as we treat ourselves better as persons and we're less shaming and harsh and mean to ourselves, the sense of self actually starts loosening, ego starts relaxing, starts easing. You know, if you want to help people or yourself be less caught up in ego, um, nurturing oneself and others as persons can really, really help that. So that's one part of the story. And my intuition is that that actually could have a lot of relevance for you. Uh, and you can think of even the very practical suggestions in the Eightfold Path as ways to support yourself as a person and support other persons and, and, and respect other persons. And in the respect of them, it also comes back to support you by practicing wise view, right intention, you know, right speech, right livelihood, right effort, and so forth. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is to really really observe the sense of self. Check out my book, Neurodharma, where I really talk about this in some detail, including in the practice of opening into allness, you know, where you start to realize more and more that the sense of self comes and goes, but the implicit assumption that there is a unified, enduring, and independent entity inside of us. If we look closely at our minds and if we also scan our brains, those three conditions are not present. 
So therefore, the presumed entity that's unified, enduring, and independent doesn't actually exist. We have a presumption of it, we have a sense of it, but it, it, isn't, it isn't real. Uh, what, what is real is process, interdependent arising, and compoundedness, rather than unification, independence, and endurance. So the point, therefore, is to realize that we can increasingly abide in this world in relation to others, standing up for ourselves, standing up for others, taking care of our needs, enjoying a compliment, enjoying a hug, enjoying someone who praises us at work. It's okay. We can do all those things with less and less of a sense of me, myself, and I. Less and less sense of mine. Um, we really can do both, and they aid each other. So I better finish here because we're at the end of our time. I'll just leave it at that, Amrit, if that's okay. And, sure. Yeah. And in case you have any resources that help talk about that continuum to help people understand that, that'd be great. Oh, I do. I, I would say first, the last chapter of Buddha's Brain is all about that. It's my favorite chapter in that book. Um, in uh, Neurodharma in particular, I talk about relaxing the sense of self, but also the importance of honoring ourselves as persons. And that distinction is really, really useful. And then I talk a lot about a lot of ways to honor ourselves as persons. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. There's a wonderful little, uh, I'll finish here with this lovely little statement uh, from a, a teacher in Southeast Asia who said, uh, in print, it kind of makes sense. Love yourself. Just don't love your self. And that, I think, says so much right there. Okay. Well, we covered a lot of ground. I hope this was useful. Uh, and I wanted to say in the months ahead, what I'm going to do is focus more on relationships. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk about very specific practices, very realistic things that we can do uh, inside our own minds and in how we interact with other people to implement the wisdom of the Four Noble Truths in our everyday life. Relationships are such a fundamental opportunity and, frankly, field of battle sometimes. And I'll explore in the months ahead six major themes. Befriending yourself, warming the heart, being at peace with others, standing up for yourself, speaking wisely, and loving the world. So those will be our six overarching themes, and I'll get very, very practical starting next week. So I hope you'll join us. I hope we'll invite other people. Uh, this is really down-to-earth and universal material that I'm going to be exploring with you, and I hope you come. So let's just sit for a few breaths at least together. And if you're still, in, and then I'll ring the bell, we'll end formally. Thank you for the beautiful comments coming in. I read all the comments coming in the chat sometimes afterward, but I, I definitely will read everything you say, even if I can't respond to it. Thank you for your practice and your presence.